Libertarianism is pro-immigration, pro-market, pro-trade. More competitive, less centralized. Not military confrontations, but peaceful interaction. The war on drugs has been actually an unmitigated disaster. You can still see to this day at one of his homes in um, not far from the fee, old fee office in Westchester County. You can go through and see his meticulous handwriting of how he spent every penny, even as a teenager, including how much he tithed faithfully at least 10% of his income, <coughs> even from a very uh, early age. Well, he's, he's an entrepreneur. He may not have realized that at first that he, that he was, but he clearly, you look back on it and you realize he was the kind of guy who looks around uh, with a nose for opportunity. I heard it said by a great economist, uh, Israel Kirzner. He was describing uh, the role of the entrepreneur in a free economy. And he put it this way. He said, in every free economy, uh, there is a kind of uh, figurative blizzard of $10 bills flying overhead, just within reach. Think of the free economy as a blizzard of $10 bills. It's the entrepreneur unlike the non-entrepreneur who notices the blizzard. Now you might say, well, doesn't everybody sooner or later notice it? Well, I don't know. Some people seem never to. But there are a lot of people who notice the blizzard, each $10 bill uh, representing an opportunity. There are a lot of people who notice but don't have the courage to act. And Rockefeller had both. He had the perception that there was an opportunity and he had the courage to dump his savings and to borrow other monies and to try to developing uh, uh, a company that could make money in this new and very risky business of bringing forth crude oil and refining it into kerosene. So in 1865, after he saved his money and borrowed some more, he co-founded a partnership in the oil refining business. That was his first year in the business, 1865. Five years later, in 1870, he formed the Standard Oil Company. And in that first year, keep in mind, that's only, what, uh, 11 years since the first well was drilled. In 1870, the Standard Oil Company, its first year, had 4% of, uh, of the market for refined oil products, which was almost exclusively kerosene at that time. 4% of the market, that's all. In 1890, 20 years later, the Standard Oil Company will have 90% of the market. And this is the source of a lot of the uh, uh, nasty stuff about Rockefeller. There are people who say, oh, look at that, 90%. How can anybody sell 90% of anything and not have gotten to that point without having ripped somebody off or abused their customers or somehow uh, stuck into their competition? I mean, nobody should be that big. It gives them too much power. There is a knee-jerk feeling that, uh, oh, 90%. But you know, market share is a, is a, a tricky thing to define. It, it depends to a great extent upon how you define the market. Uh, you know, I'm in the market for speech making, I guess you could say, right? If I were to def define the market that I'm in as the market for lectures by Lawrence Reed, I'm a monopolist. Holy cow, I got 100% of that market, right? But is that is it proper to define the market I'm in as that? I don't think so. I'm in the market for speeches, and then I look pretty small. Okay? So uh, you have to consider what uh, things like, what, how, do you, how do you define the market? You can define almost any market narrowly enough to make anybody, at least for the moment, look like a monopolist. Uh, but that's, a, that's another subject, actually. But, at least for refined oil products, principally kerosene, he had 90% in 1890. Now, what do you suppose happened to the price of kerosene during the 20 years from the foundation of Standard Oil uh, to the, uh, uh, or I guess that would be 25 years from the beginning, of, no, no, 1870, 20 years. What do you suppose happened to the price of kerosene during that time when Rockefeller's getting so big? Yes, sir. I think it's down. Went down, okay. Now, what, to those who decry capitalism and robber barons, you know, they, they probably just assume that, oh no, he must have jacked the price up and was gouging us. Uh-uh, 
the price fell from 45 cents a gallon consistently, year after year, uh, to six cents a gallon uh, in the mid-1870s. And in 1890, when he's at his peak market share, it was three cents a gallon. And the kerosene of 1890 was much improved from the kerosene of 1870. Burned cleaner, it was just better stuff. And for a fraction of the cost, it was like the iPhone of the day, or I mean, you pick the technology that even you've seen in your lifetimes. It was so expensive when it came out a few years later. Computers. Plasma TVs, computers, yeah. Now you give entrepreneurs an opportunity to go to town, make money, serve customers, don't harass the heck out of them or tax the life out of them. And usually what they make ends up uh, being not only dramatically improved, but cut in cost as well. Free markets uh, tend to do that. But if you still are concerned about the 90% share figure, let me also tell you that he had that 90% market share for an ever so brief moment. Even by 1911, when the Supreme Court, uh, uh, in a famous case, broke up standard, I think for, I'll get to that later, but I think for very bad reasons, uh, even by 1911, the marketplace had already whittled that away, that 90% down to about 60%. Okay, he only had, he was that 90% for an ever so brief moment. And I should tell you uh, why that's the case, because of the other things that were happening at the time. Um, think back from what you know of American history, 1880s, 1890s, age of invention and industrial growth, and America becoming one of the greatest economic powers in the world at that time. Not yet eclipsing Great Britain in per capita income. We wouldn't pass them up until 1914, believe it or not. We're still number two uh, in that regard in the uh, 1890s and the first decade of the 20th century. But we're really on the move uh, all over the world, uh, becoming a major factor in, in world trade. What happens in the 1890s, right at the time Rockefeller's at its peak with kerosene to light our homes, to change the way we light our homes again. What comes along? Are we, gonna, are we still burning oil oil? <laughs> or or uh, crude oil or kerosene? You got Thomas Edison at that time and others uh, coming up with this electricity stuff. You know, I mean, How's a guy going to make some permanent lifetime empire making something that is pretty soon going to go by the boards because of the competition of an utterly different substance, okay? Competition, you know, isn't just between people who make the same thing. It's also between people who make good substitutes, and it also exists with potential entrepreneurs who will find something you haven't even thought of yet, but will compete uh, with you, and electricity uh, increasingly will do that. You know, how can you have a monopoly if people are of, of uh, kerosene from home lighting, if increasingly people say, oh, I think I'll use this newfangled thing called electricity. Also in the 1890s, it was in 1890 in particular, the U.S. Geological Survey uh, issued a report with, this is word for word, and this was part of their conclusion. They predicted, quote, no oil will be found in Texas. <laughs> 1890. Now, what's the significance of that? Well, Rockefeller is, you know, he's making money off the oil fields that he purchased and developed in, in places like Pennsylvania and Ohio. Maybe he believed what the U.S. Geological Survey uh, said in 1890. I don't know. But I do know he was one of the last to see the opportunity emerging out of Texas. Other companies, tiny at first, soon to be major competitors, see the Texas opportunity before he does. You know, this business of being number one, being the big guy, the 90% guy uh, in any market is like a game of leapfrog. Uh, somebody's the leader at the moment, but before long, another frog is going to, could well jump over it. And usually all you need for that to happen is for there to be free market so people aren't penalized for trying. Uh, so all of, and also you have, uh, what's the other product that uh, crude oil will be increasingly used for yes. not that gasoline. Yeah, he was slow to see that, whereas other companies say, hey, we can make more money. There's this automobile thing that's coming along. Uh, we can make a lot of money in that. So he was a great businessman, but he didn't see every opportunity. Uh, and the markets were free enough and dynamic enough at the time that nobody could. 
Um, there are two kinds of so-called monopoly that I want to tell you about. And that's the charge, of course, that's thrown at Rockefeller. He was a monopolist. Well, what, what is monopoly? There are two kinds. One is called an efficiency monopoly. What is an efficiency monopoly? That sounds like a good thing. I, in fact, I think it is. It's an, effic an efficiency monopoly is a company that gets a high market share because it does the best job. That's why. Not because it uh, uses uh, nefarious uh, tactics or gets special government benefits. It just does the best job. And you know, for a long time, who was that in the film business? For decades in America, who, who dominated the film business and now they're bankrupt? Kodak. Kodak, right? Kodak. The world took pictures with Kodak film overwhelmingly for decades. Who would, you know, there, I'm sure there are a lot of people who thought, boy, there's a company that will never go bankrupt. They're on the cutting edge of technology. Well, it turns out they weren't. They were slow to see uh, the change in photography to uh, the age of uh, digitation, if that's a word. And uh, they lost out and filed for bankruptcy. I think they've reorganized, but they're a fraction of what they used to be. An efficiency monopoly is one that gets a high market share because it does the best job. And the moment it stops doing the best job, as long as markets are free, it will tend to lose its market share to, a, to another upstart, or maybe even to another giant company in another field that says, let's get into this because this guy screwed it up. Lots of competitors can come from any number of places. I, I'm not concerned about efficiency monopolies, frankly. I don't spend any time worried about, oh, this guy's selling so much stuff, uh, because he's getting an endorsement by consumers. That's why uh, he's as successful, he or she, obviously, as, as uh, he may be. I recall uh, there are some crazy lawsuits that have been filed by Federal Trade Commission uh, and other agencies of government against businesses claiming, oh, they're too big. And I'll give you an example of a super crazy one. Um, the Federal Trade Commission, years ago, it just languished in court for 10 years until it finally was just dismissed. But a lot of uh, antitrust lawyers made a lot of money off it. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission looked at five cereal makers, ready-to-eat cereal makers, and they said, oh, there's a shared monopoly in this line of work. You've got Kellogg's and General Mills and General Foods and Quaker and uh, post five companies and they're selling 80% of the ready to eat cereal in the company in the country not one company five but they just said well together they're 80% that's too much for just five companies now think about that I was I remember at the time I wanted to point out to the students I had how ridiculous this was to worry about a, you know a Captain Crunch monopoly <laughs> uh, so I asked the students, and I ask you, let me ask you, uh, think back to what you had for breakfast this morning. Let's just see how monopolistic the breakfast market is, okay? Because that's what the ready-to-eat cereal people are in, right? They're in the breakfast market for the most part, not just the ready-to-eat cereal market. How many ate a ready-to-eat cereal this morning for breakfast? Only one! <laughs> oh my God. Only one victim of this awful monopoly. Okay, what else did you have for breakfast? I'll bet somebody had eggs, bacon and eggs. eggs. I'll, bet somebody, eggs. Right? I'll <laughs> bet somebody else had oatmeal. I'll bet somebody else. I'll bet you had a Coke and a cigarette. <laughs> How did you know? <laughs> because I know you did. <laughs> so, but they compete against anybody who makes anything that anybody eats for breakfast. And yet the FTC said, oh, they're selling too much of this narrowly defined stuff called ready-to-eat cereal. Ten years of wasted taxpayer money until they finally, uh, uh, it was under the Reagan administration, they said, what are we doing this for? And just threw it out. So, but anyway, we need to get back to uh, the standard oil, but that's an important uh, uh, point. Uh, the other kind of monopoly is one that I think there is cause to be concerned about, and it's a coercive monopoly. Coercive. And as the name implies, this is a monopoly that gets its high market share because of some means, some method involving coercion.